I'm David Burns. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Educational Studies at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. Tonight I'm talking about scientific literacy and in particular scientific literacy for non-scientists. The topic tonight is important because most science education and most science is done by people who are not themselves scientists. So when you ask a question at the grocery store about what kind of food to buy, you decide whether or not to fill the prescription your doctor's given you, these are all scientific questions and most of the time it's not scientists who have to make the decision. My name is Pauline Finn. I am the Vice President of Community Engagement here at Science World British Columbia. And it is my honor to welcome you to our third talk in our fabulous series with KPU. I do have something important in my pocket to remind me. Thanks for food. Food is good. Um, and thank you for coming out on the first day of school. And if you haven't picked up your apple, do get one at the end of the talk today. Science World, as most of you are aware, um, we are a mission-based, not-for-profit organization. And we're committed to turning the community on to science and technology. We do that in a number of ways with many different programs. Um, directed at different ages and throughout the province and locally with the help of brilliant and fabulous partners like KPU. So if any of you are in Abbotsford, please check out the Eco Dairy in Abbotsford. We've worked with them on their exhibitions. And if you are in Prince George, check out the Exploration Place. We're working with them to revitalize their school programs. So without much further ado, I would like to pass the apple over to Diane Purvey, <coughs> Dean of Arts, and thank you again all for coming out on the first day of school to join us. Cheers. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you tonight. Thank you for coming out. Um, on behalf of the university, I'd like to welcome you to Science World tonight. And we're particularly proud of this uh, partnership we have with Science World and uh, their support and collaboration for our speaker series. We'd also like to acknowledge the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, SHRC, who provided funding for tonight's presentation. And this uh, grant that we applied for was done on the part of both doctors, Daniel Bernstein, who's the Canada Research Chair of Lifespan Cognition at Kwantlen, and also Dr. Rajiv Jiani, both faculty members at the Department of Psychology. Thanks to both for your uh, ongoing dedication to uh, the expansion of science in our communities. Each of you would have received a bag tonight when you arrived, and inside you'll find a survey. Uh, and we would appreciate it if you could complete the survey by the end of the evening. There's an entry form at the bottom of each survey as well to encourage you to fill it out and uh, drop it off before you leave for a chance to win a prize. Tonight is the third installment of the KPU Science World Speaker Series, and I'm really honored to welcome uh, Dr. David Burns, one of our esteemed faculty members in the uh, Faculty of Arts and in Educational Studies at Kwantlen. David Burns holds a B.Ed. in Secondary Education and an M.Ed. and Ph.D. in Educational Policy Studies from the University of Alberta. Before coming to KPU, Dr. Burns taught at the Universities of Alberta and BC, and he, he also worked as a high school teacher and educational consultant. His areas of specialization include philosophy of education, professional ethics, moral character education, and environmental education. Dr. Burns has lectured on law, ethics, and philosophy of education, as well as teaching methods, classroom management, and social justice. He's published in all sorts of journals, including the Canadian Journal for Science, Mathematics, and Technology Education, Curriculum and Pedagogy, and Globalization Societies in Education. Dr. Burns is a, a fantastic faculty member. He's um, a brilliant teacher. His classes are always full. Students rave about him. He's dedicated to the institution, and he always shows up for service. He's just a fantastic person, and I'm so pleased that you'll have the opportunity to hear him speak tonight. So please join me in welcoming him. OK. Does that microphone work? OK, perfect. I'm getting all sappy right at the beginning of it. It's like one of those moments at a party where like, I love you too, guys. It's great. <laughs> 
So uh, welcome to Science World, and thank you to everybody here for, for coming on such a lovely evening. It would be very easy to be off walking the marina right now outside. I don't want to taunt you with how nice the evening is, but it's absolutely lovely. Uh, now that I've got both microphones on, though, we'll, we'll actually have to do this. It starts to feel vaguely like a Britney Spears concert, but <laughs> if you... Okay, just people are laughing here. I'm just going <laughs> to focus on that for a while. Okay, so <laughs> I'm uh, David Burns, as the Dean so graciously indicated. Uh, I do two things in my job, basically, other than these jokes, which I apologize for. One of them is that I teach and research about the reasons for being educated. And this is one of the core missions for the Department of Educational Studies at Kwantlen. We want to ask and discuss and analyze what is the difference between an educated person and a person who hasn't had those opportunities yet. Why would I bother going to high school or to university or going to science world? How does that change me and how does it help me change the people around me? After discussing that, or as, as we do, we then ask how can we accomplish that? So if we say that this is what an educated person ought to be, how they ought to sound, what they ought to do, how they ought to feel, how can we make that happen? What kind of skills or strategies or experiences do they need? So why are we educated? Why should we be? And how can we make that happen? I am not a scientist. Not at all. I've studied teaching all my life. I taught a science course when I was in high school, but I am not myself a scientist, which is why I want to talk about this dis discussion here today. While I do read scientific information and I try to make decisions in light of scientific knowledge and using scientific methods, there's nobody that would call me a scientist. Right? They asked me if I wanted to see my laptop. I'm like, no, I'm sure the slides are fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I actually told my brother, I, say, I'm, I keep texting people. I know, like, sorry, I'm just doing a big talk tonight. Ken. And they're like, oh, we didn't actually message you, Dave. I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> I said to my brother, who's an actual science teacher, I said, you know, I'm doing a lecture at Science World. And he said, like, you know, you're supposed to know some science for that, Dave. <laughs> oh, you know what? Fine. You're not invited. Oh, you signed up for this voluntarily. This is your fault, too. So I am in this large category of non-scientists. And all jokes aside, this is kind of the point of my discussion here tonight. It's that, as you can tell, while I might not know very much science in the formal professional sense, that's actually where the vast majority of people are. And indeed, statistically, most science education and most science is taken up by people who are not themselves professional scientists. That's the most powerful moments in our lives sometimes happen in light of scientific evidence or using scientific ideas. And there's lots of different ways in which we can understand this. So when I took a look at the, the pictures they put together in marketing for this poster here, I saw like the traditional professional scientific models, right? So when we say like, we're talking about science tonight, we open up the filing cabinet and out comes the pictures of the people with beakers, right? The lab coat the big machine. <laughs> There's me with my eyes closed for reasons I don't fully understand. But these are the traditional symbols of science. And when we say, yeah, if you took like an hour for those pictures that I got the one where I just go like, hi. When we see these images, this is what we think of when we hear about science. So it's no accident that when you see a commercial trying to sell some kind of medication, the person's almost always in a lab coat in some kind of medical setting. Because if they're in an alley sitting in the back of a van and they say, you should buy this thing, we're not going to see the scientific credibility, right? <laughs> I'm real sorry. Now, there's lots of ways that you can see scientists, science in your everyday life, right? I think of this a lot in terms of my child. Well, one of my neighbors used to be this physical education expert. She's a PhD in physical education. Really interesting person. She said, you know, Dave, if I could tell you one thing about raising your kid, it's that there's this really crazy misconception about peripheral vision and motion tracking. And that it's that when you play catch with a kid, you're always trying to be really, really gentle. So you kind of throw the ball like this. Always just like that. And she said, that's a mistake. Kids actually motion track much better horizontally at first than they do vertically. So if you throw it just straight up and down, it's almost always just going to hit them. So I've got a two-year-old at the time. You know, I've got to try this. So sure enough, you know, bonk, you know. And that's one of the first places where I started thinking, like, you know, this science is really, really powerful in these everyday kind of little moments. <laughs> that these things that you learn about how kids develop motion tracking sound kind of arcane and abstract at first, but when you think, you know, I could have used that knowledge to not hit my daughter in the face, <laughs> it can become really, really powerful. 
so glad that all of the people I work for at the university are here right now. <laughs> oh boy, I'm so alone. <laughs> I was at a condo board meeting. Don't ever sign up for your condo board. We had really leaky pipes, right, that kept coming out the ceiling. As far as I know, that's bad. So we called in a company and they said, you should put this special plastic coating inside the pipes for the whole building. It'll cost this much money, here are the risks, this is what you should do. So I said, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna listen to this, but I'm also gonna pick up my tablet and start trying to research what this material is. It was made with bisphenol A, the BPH stuff you see on water bottles, you know, where you're supposed to buy a water bottle without this stuff in it. And I said, you know, I don't know too much about this compound, but I've got a really young kid, and just on the face of it, having plastic in what used to be copper pipes might be risky. So I, I searched it up. I looked at the article database while we were sitting in the room with, with this business person, and I couldn't find one study that company didn't pay for. Not one on that chemical in those pipes. Now, I don't know if it's dangerous. I didn't find any evidence that it was, but I certainly couldn't find anything to say that it was safe. And all jokes aside about, you know, throwing Nerf balls and things around, that's kind of a big deal. Making a decision like that, that's irreversible. If you don't like it, you have to move. And that seeps into your water quite literally every day. And so you can see how the science in that moment isn't just about these sort of abstract lab conditions, but it's about actual decisions that you make today, here and now. And that's what I wanted to talk about here tonight, these moments where science is part of the average citizen's actual life. And if you take a bunch of these decisions together, you know, like you talk about picking out your groceries, do I buy organic food or I buy the mutant food that's much bigger and cheaper and so forth. They always say that, say this is organic and this is just not organic. They should have to call the other one like superfood or something, more fun. I got some pity laugh for the first two or three jokes and now I'm just, sort of just okay, come on. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. So I started to look at this a bit more seriously and I had a talk like this one a few weeks ago where we had to go to Ottawa. And as soon as you pull into the hotel, you're confronted with these kind of everyday citizen science questions. The first thing we saw was this poster saying, put your towels here if they're gonna be washed, put them here if you're gonna use them again. So what did I do? You know, I, I hung the towels up. I'm, I'm going to use that towel every day for a week. It's going to be disgusting, but I'm going to save the whole environment. Right? And you feel good because you did that. It's like when you use your coffee mug and refill it, or you have reusable shopping bags. You get that little sort of dopamine hit. You're like, oh, that's good. I did a good thing. Then I went home and I said, you know what? Is this actually scientifically sound, that, that this is a good thing I'm doing? And yeah, it is, but it turns out it's pretty infinitesimally small. If you take that activity there, using the same towel over and over again, this is according to an article The Economist put together, that saves 1.4 kilograms of CO2 equivalent in our emissions. If you took an airplane on that trip, you've already used 1,000. So you'd have to not use a lot of towels for a really long time for that to make a difference. So if we're talking about really sound science, then the poster in the hotel said, well, if you've got here, you've kind of already messed up. Right? Unless you walked. And I checked the distance. The example here is to, from London to Nairobi. That's about the same as here to Halifax, which is not an unusual flight for somebody going to like a domestic conference, right? That's a thousand times what you would just saving the towels all week. It's pretty incredible. This is the kind of question that this university, KPU, is supposed to address. It's called a polytechnic university, and you know, you see this on these posters and things, but it's not always entirely clear what that means. If you dig into it, what that means is that we're trying to bridge the gap between the research you see at the university and the decisions people make in their lives, in their jobs, in their day-to-day -day existence. So we've got research, we've got all these things going on, but we're also asking how can this make you better at the thing that you're doing? Make better decisions when you get to the hotel. Be a better teacher when you get into the classroom. Be a better sustainability engineer when you get out into practice. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about questions like that. The problem is the gap is enormous, absolutely enormous. I did a, a book chapter a couple of years ago on scientific literacy, and it takes ages and ages and ages to get published. Like I might as well have been writing about the invention of the internet by the time this kind of stuff comes out. And the problem is it gets thrown in tomes like this one. They sent it in the mail, there's three volumes, whole bunch, like a couple hundred authors, and it costs a thousand dollars. And it's that big. Someone handed me Game of Thrones for free, it's that thick, no, I will watch the TV show, thank you, right? That's a lot to ask someone to read and understand and digest. 
And the issue here is that it's not just like you have one set of information or ideas to, to discern or understand in your life, right? You've got this enormous body of sources and lots and lots of decisions to make with it. Now, the problem is even worse than that because it turns out that not even scientists have that kind of broad understanding across research in, in different disciplines. The way science works today, if you're, for example, in physics, it's unlikely that you have a close, specialized knowledge of any of the other branches of, of science, for example. If you take a look at that big Nobel Prize winning paper coming out of the Hadron Collider in Europe, there's a thousand authors on that. And not one of those people has the full view of that entire experiment. It crosses several countries and thousands of kilometers. And so not one person in that entire project really knows the entirety, the totality of what's going on. And so a lot of our traditional ways of thinking about how to understand science have changed. It's so complex, it's so wide, it's so diverse. We have to change how we think about it. And that's why places like this exist. We try to have a lot of things like this, scientific outreach, science fairs. We have a lot of scientific journalism and so science places like Science World. But we can only really get really broad stroke kind of information like that. I was at the grocery store yesterday. I forgot to you know, get milk again. This happens almost every day. And I stopped and you know, I'll pick up you know, popular science, you know, one of these magazines that people read to get some basic scientific information. And it covers everything. You name the discipline in science, they've got a little bit in that magazine about that. Just a little bit off the top of a whole bunch of different areas. And that's great, but you're not getting the kind of depth of knowledge you'd need to make a good decision about, say, building the pipes in your house. So I said, you know, is this reasonable? Does a real person have time by real person, I mean one that's like not like me in his office all the time, Googling articles and talking to himself, like someone with a real job. Can they go out and make these decisions? So I actually got a really, really bad cold this last week or two. I've been spending the last month on you know, Benadryl or whatever it is, you know, a lot of this kind of cold medication. I said, well, you know, is there anything that can help with this? And I went down to the local pharmacy, and the little rack they have there on the, right in the way in says, you know, allergy prevention and stuff like that. And I looked down the, the aisle, and there's this huge range of different things. And I said, OK, Dave, one hour. Is this a good idea? Go. And I sat down on my, my laptop and said, let's see if I can figure this out, right? All right, Google, can I get some kind of natural, organic, locally made medication to help me with these seasonal allergies? First thing that comes up, DIYnatural.com. It indicates if you have fall allergies, you need to use raw, local honey that is harvested in the fall. If you buy raw, local honey that was harvested in the spring, you'll no doubt enjoy some, <laughs> you'll no doubt enjoy some honey. <laughs> I don't, this is really funny to me. And get some health benefits. You will not, however, benefit from the allergy prevention because the pollens to which you're allergic will not be found in the honey. The assumption seems to be that if the honey traps the pollens that bother you, taking this medication beforehand can help. That doesn't seem quite right to me. I mean, it's got superficial plausibility, but there weren't very many citations there, and that's always a flag, you know, if they don't say where the information comes from. That's the equivalent of, you know, the guy in the van in the alley going like, oh, come on, you trust me, you know, lab coat. So I kept looking. This came up from Slate.com, which is a really, really good online news magazine. They, they document their sources really thoroughly. Two things stand out. First of all, bees don't make honey from pollen. <laughs> they make it from nectar. And right away there, the first article I read didn't catch that. And then I found this one, like, oh, wait a minute, okay, yeah, yeah, feel kind of embarrassed there. And second, even if it did, the stuff that causes your allergies isn't actually coming from the plants that they think it is. Flowering plants are generally too large to trigger those reactions. So the, the bees are landing on these theoretical flowers and bringing these pollens in that aren't actually the right size to cause that problem in the first place. So two articles, drastically different conclusions, right, that seem to directly disagree with one another. Pretty remarkable. So I'm still trying to figure this out. So how do I figure it out? Okay, well, who actually uses this? It looks like they get about 850 Facebook likes for that first article. Slate.com, with all those sources, and you could follow it right through to the journal articles, gets about the same. So really rough metric, these are both very popular things to read which is a bit scary because one seems to be much better sourced and more scientifically robust than the other. So I took a look in the periodical databases, the search things you get at the library at the university, and I found a couple of articles. One of them said it's preliminary, but this kind of thing might work for the 44 people we could track down. Okay, that's, that's interesting. I read the article you know, as much as I could, at very limited time. 
All right, 44, that might make sense. I kept looking, found another article that said, okay, well, we looked at all the articles on the subject and tried to bring them all together. It's called a meta-analysis. And we found here, it seems like it might, but again, we've got a very, very small sample size. So I sat there with these two articles, both from peer-reviewed public journals. I found them saying, okay, well, we might, we might think this, we're not sure, but we haven't checked with very many people yet, so we probably shouldn't say much. And then it's right about that time that the timer goes off. Now, <laughs> so the timer, beep honey hall, and then it goes buzz. <laughs> Last night I was going through the slides, like, no, just leave that in, they'll like that. <laughs> no, they didn't, okay. <laughs> oh boy, this is on camera, yeah, okay. So if that was the question, I give myself one hour. Actual person, I've got things to do, got to pick the kid up from daycare, I've got one hour, do I buy this or not? Well, I don't know. It seems like some of the scientists think you might, but it's not super clear right now. So I go home without it, basically. Not entirely clear. It's because of this. This is really, really interesting. It turns out that you can't expect science to give you that kind of answer. Right? It's not going to say, buy that thing or don't. And I looked up some good examples. This is one of the favorite ones I found. This is at Vox. I'll bring this website up later. It's really, really good. This is a chart of individual medical studies trying to figure out if something is related to causing or preventing cancer. And you could take a look at this. I mean, so it looks like beef is, most of the studies seem to indicate that beef is related to higher rates of, of getting cancer. But then you see some like, you know, wine, for example, where it's the other side, right? And this is why you see the evening news all the time, and they're always saying things like, find out at five. The thing you're drinking right now could kill you, you know, tonight at five. And they're like, oh, tell me now. I could be drinking it right now. Why don't you care, CBC Vancouver? Why would you hold that information back for three hours needlessly? Well, it turns out we don't actually know. And from the, a lot of us in this room, of course, work on studies like this at universities. And you know, if you've read these things before they get published, what you actually say is, in this many out of this many cases, it seems most probable, but this was related to this other thing, right? And then it gets published like that. And then when it gets picked up by the news media, it's usually something like, don't eat this, you're going to die because that's going to make the headline, right? And so we tend to think that science will provide an answer rather than what it actually does. Right? It gives us some idea, but you need to see it in the really, really big picture to get much sense out of it. Now, the issue here again is that, okay, fine, it's fair enough to say you should be reading a really wide range of this literature, but I don't just have this one decision to make. So the day I needed to figure out if the bee, bee honey pollen is going to work for my allergies, I still had to pick my daughter up from one of her first days of daycare. I needed to get that milk still. I always forget it. I had some actual work to do, and at some point, I have to show up at my office. They stop sending you money in the mail if you stop going. So you just kind of, sort of walk around until the deans all see me and okay, check. <laughs> Very good. This is why you show up at Science World. I haven't been at work in a month. <laughs> we show up here, all the, you know, check. So this is why we get into this kind of trouble, right? At CBC and the Canadian uh, Association of Academies did this study up here, and they found that basically Canadians really, really broadly think science is a good thing that improves our lives and gives us useful information, right? The number of people who say, I think it's not important in my life, or that science makes us change too quickly, or that we need to rely more on faith rather than science, is actually pretty low. I'm curious to hear how they frame that question about faith, but you get the idea. I mean, Canadians are broadly supportive of science as a field of inquiry and knowledge. But at the same time, it turns out that as much as we think science is great, we tend not to know all that much about it. This is from the CBC. Canadians are among the most scientifically literate people in the world, a new report reveals. But don't get too smug yet, <laughs> you Vancouverites. <laughs> it, you're all from Vancouver and you're laughing at that. Think about that for a minute. In spite of that, fewer than half of us would be able to read and understand a newspaper article about a scientific or new scientific discovery. A new report, Science Culture, Where Canada Stands, released today by the Canadian Council of Academies, found that 42% of Canadians have a basic level of scientific literacy necessary to understand media reports about science, putting Canada first among 35 countries with similar data. So less than half of us can understand one article about something like that cancer question. One. And that puts us at the top of developed countries, which tells you something about the general state of scientific literacy which is the term I want to focus on for the rest of the night today. Look at that good sketch, scientific literacy. I, wa I wanted like a smoke machine, but they said we didn't have the budget for that. <laughs> I know, should I call science? 
I don't know what they're called. I think it's dais, where the thing turns and it sort of raises you from underneath it, you know? <laughs> but everybody's pretty serious? Okay, yeah, this is good. The associate dean is trash talking me right now. <laughs> this, is, this is my life. I'm really glad. So this is the study that I worked on, actually. This is with my old mentor, Canada Research Chair for the Public Understanding of Science, Stephen Norris, who actually passed away just last year. But he had this enormous body of research on scientific literacy. And uh, Linda Phillips, also from the University of Alberta, who's a leading figure in childhood literacy. So we did this study where we said, OK, just pull all the articles you can where people say this is what scientific literacy is. This is what a person who knows enough science can do and think like this is the capacities they have. This is actually like the first month that I was at Kwantlen. I was just teaching part time and they said, hey, can you just read like thousands of pages? And I said, of course, yes, of course, let's try that. And so we cataloged all this stuff to find out why we should know about science. We found some really interesting things. And one of the things I found the most interesting is this notion that a really scientifically literate citizen is independent. That you should make your own decisions. And this, this resonates with people a lot, right? The more you know, the more educated you are, the more you should be able to figure things out on your own, at least in theory. Now, this takes a number of different forms. One of them is that we tend to think we need to be free of, in particular, things like government power. That when we're told something is the case, we should be able to decide for ourselves if it actually is. Right? So if the government says that fluoride in the water is a good or a bad thing, a lot of people will suggest you should be able to find out as a citizen whether you think that's good or not. I did look this up, actually. Different Canadian cities put more or less fluoride in the water, and children's toothpaste sometimes has it and sometimes does not, based on their assumptions about what city you're in. Because you don't want the water and the toothpaste to have fluoride, because apparently that's too much. Right? It's one of those many tiny, tiny decisions. And when you're a, a young parent, of course, they scare you to death about this. Like, if, well, if you have too much toothpaste there, terrible life she's going to have. Just terrible, right? Because it all feels really heavy in the moment you're making the decision. You also have to make a lot of decisions in light of private interests. And, of course, being free from scientists as well. That just because it says in the newspaper that scientists have discovered that this is good for you doesn't necessarily mean that a free citizen must accept that thing. Now, in the case of the... Bee, punny, bee, punny, bee, honey, pollen example. I should have prepped that, you know, beforehand. Uh, it turns out this is a lot about private interests, that when we are told that these things are good for us or that work as medications, there's a lot of people who stand to make money from it, right? And that the manifestation of being free in this case is deciding whether or not that's actually good for you and your family. I went to find some examples of this, and I was absolutely stunned. So do we actually need to free ourselves from the way that scientists and academics and companies promote and research these things? And I found this. Now, I know what you're thinking. 70% off? Wow. <laughs> when I saw that, I'm like, oh, a summer sale. Maybe after the talk, I'll go look that up. But in that article, I actually found indication that there's been some evidence found recently that both the alternative medicine kind of companies and the organic food companies and the big genetically modified companies and big pharmaceutical companies are both paying academics to go and speak on their behalf. So when you see the research about this stuff, it's actually that both sides have people producing partisan information from the inside, which is a scary thought. Because when you see an academic speaking at a place like this, you just kind of assume naturally that they're there out of academic integrity or free speech to say, okay, this is what I found in my research, right? You don't necessarily think, okay, before I understand this, I've got to really dig down and see where the money's coming from for that, right? I borrowed the bus fare just to get that. You know. <laughs> oh, dear. So there's really granular kinds of decisions like this. Everyday stuff, you go to the pharmacy, you have to make the call. But there's also really big picture ones where this is important. And when I was looking in the spring there for a really big case study example of this that worked perfectly, I think pipelines are a great one. These are enormous, enormous decisions that have far-reaching implications for your community, for the economy, and for the world, right? So when you're deciding whether or not you want something like a pipeline running through your community, that seems like it has a very significant scientific dimension. So I asked that, okay, regular voter, got some time, do I want this new pipeline from Edmonton to Vancouver? One hour, go. So I looked it up, pipelines, what's it called? I don't know. From there to there. I'm actually from Edmonton. This is the route almost exactly, I think, that I drove coming home from vacation this summer. So the idea is that there might be a pipeline built down this route. The darkest color is the existing pipeline, and the other colors are the areas that will be diverted or built and so forth. Right? 
So it seems like this is a really scientific question, right? I mean, this is one of those things where if you know a lot about science, you can make a really, really good decision. So let's see if it's possible. So in this case, you see all of these interests, right? A free citizen would have to make these decisions, perhaps despite what the government might be telling you, despite perhaps what oil companies or unions or corporations are telling you, and perhaps, depending on where the scientists are coming from, what the scientists say we ought to do. So I tried to look this up, and it's very, very difficult. I found a few examples, as you might imagine, saying that a pipeline like this one would cause a significant increase in carbon dioxide emissions and pollutants, that we'd be pulling fossil fuels out of the ground that shouldn't be pulled out of the ground. And then a little while into the research, I found someone arguing, you know, actually, no, pipelines categorically don't cause pollution. They're part of a system that causes pollution, but they simply move pollution around. That's a distinction we should think about. So well, that's kind of interesting. That's very interesting. And then went over to the next website. This one's from the company that's proposing it. I saw all these claims that there's going to be all kinds of new jobs produced, that there will be more British Columbians and Albertans working in different industries because the pipeline might get built here or there. And so I looked into that, and it turns out that's actually hard to guess as well, that a lot of these jobs are very temporary. And that so one side is saying, oh, this is about jobs, and well, there might not be that many jobs. And the other side is saying this is about pollution. Say, well, the pollution is already happening anyway. This is just part of a really big, bad system. It's very hard to decide because you're getting a lot of ambiguity in both cases. So I really dug, I tried to find the best source of information for this. There is a full impact assessment for the particular proposed pipeline that we're looking at in BC that you can get for free on the web. It is, however, and you can see way at the top, 1,567 pages long. Now, if you show up for a Science World talk, you don't need to be at on a lovely Tuesday night. That's one level of keen. If you read 1,500 pages of environmental impact assessment and you do not work for that company or the government, you need to see some kind of help. <laughs> when you take a look at this, and it's okay, well, what does it actually say? This is the kind of thing you see in documents like that. And again, I look at educational policy, right? I spend most of my time looking at the law. I do a bit of scientific research, but not a ton. So when I see this, I say, wow, this is a lot to digest. So let's take a look at my personal favorite bird, the early cereal forest bird which is a term I've literally never heard before I, I came up with this example. If somebody knows what that is, I mean, good for you. That's terrific. And I sat down for a while. It's okay, well, there's different levels of habitat. Okay, I guess so some certain amount of the habitat is really suitable for this kind of bird. I think it's a kind of bird. And it looks like that's going to change by a very small amount over time, right? Like there's, we're going to lose some hectares of high suitability nesting territory for this kind of bird. And oh, maybe I should do uh, hours up. I got one bar out of 1,500 pages. Time's up. I got a little bit from a couple of websites, part of that chart, done. Now, the normal person's probably going to stop there, right? You've got to pick the kids up. You've got things to do. And this is one of the problems with how we tend to think about scientific literacy, that if we think we're going to dig all the way to the bottom and figure it all out for ourselves from the start and make an independent decision, we're mostly wrong. We don't have the time, we don't have the resources. But, and here, don't have much of an answer, it's not actually where the conversation needs to end, because this isn't the only vision of scientific literacy we have. In fact, it's not even the dominant one anymore. We tend to think, rather, move ahead here, that this kind of independence is actually almost impossible. And this is one of the things that Stephen Norris, this scholar I worked for before, was arguing. He said that we actually can't be all that independent. He called these Hardwig limits. That for those of us who aren't scientists, the idea that we can make a totally independent, autonomous decision about some serious scientific question is unreasonable. We're not going to get there. And expecting us to do so is just a recipe for spending all of your time on one really tiny decision and then not having much of it left to spread around. The way that we found actually does work and that makes more sense and so when we started dividing up the basic objectives for scientific literacy, and I put this up here just because it's a fancy chart. You know, I've always wanted to have a graph in my career that I could point at. Yeah, you can tell. Uh, but it basically means this. Scientific literacy is much, much broader than that. And the role of science in your life is much, much broader. The stuff we tend to think about around intellectual independence deals mostly with knowledge, just knowing scientific material. But we also need to understand how to practice science and how to be scientific. So if you take a look at knowledge, for example, one of the things that's most confusing and obfuscating about this pipeline conversation is that one of the things you just need to know is how interdependent these ecosystems are. 
We don't know necessarily how a pipe here is going to impact this animal, is going to impact this one. I mean, growing up in Alberta, there was this crazy case study one of my high school teachers showed me. They were trying to explore for natural gas or something, and they can't just dig down to find out if it's there in the forest. It's too hard. So they'd lay these lines of charges in the ground and just set them off, kind of like firecrackers, to go <laughs> That was my sound effect. I used all the budget at the smoke machine. And it would bore this line to the forest so that the engineers could go in and, and find the fuel or whatever indication they could that there's oil or something down there. And it turns out, nobody guessed this, but that all these wolves that live in the prairie around these forests could now get into the forest. And they started decimating the sort of medium-sized mammal population. The deer, who were always protected from wolves, were now somehow vulnerable to them because of these nice little wolf highways right through the trees. And someone said, OK, well, we've got too many wolves now, so what should we do? Well, we should kill the wolves, right? You should call some of the wolf population, put things back into balance. And all of a sudden, you've got your hands on all these holes in the dam. And it's not really clear how we can fix it. That's really hard to just know that. But fortunately, science is also about being able to digest and understand material. So for example, a little bit of learning about how to read statistical data can actually help you in a large number of these kind of case studies. So you take a look at that cancer study, for example. If you know how to read a correlation, for example, that will allow you or enable you to read lots of different kinds of material on different subjects. And then even more easily for the average person, we can all have a scientific mindset. So being the kind of person that says, no, I need to go out and check. I'm a disciplined, empirical thinker. If we're going to say that's true, I'm going to try to find some way to observe it. It's not enough for me to say, you know, what, some of my students will say this sometimes. They'll write a paper, and they'll do that first sentence that we seem to always teach young people to use, that this question has been significant since the beginning of time, and all, you know, this kind of thing that we all kind of learn in our essays. Well, has it been significant? I'll have people say things like, okay, you know, nobody uses that social network anymore. So, well, no, not nobody, fewer, less, a majority, a plurality. What is it? You know, this is why I don't get invited to parties, right? <laughs> <laughs> Except for this one. Oh, wow, that's awkward laughter. And the further over that chart you get, the more it's possible for us, just average people on the street, to do this kind of thing. To say, okay, you know, I don't know everything about eco ecosystem or ecosystemic interdependency. I'm not going to. I've got other things to do. But I can be the kind of person that asks those questions. I can be the kind of person who knows how to look it up when I find out I need to. And there's lots and lots of capacity for this nowadays. And so I'll start off with knowledge. This model here, this is my favorite special, this is my whole special effects budget. This model here is basically broken. This idea that you're going to go to the library, just get a bunch of big, tall textbooks, and go home and study them and make a better decision, it doesn't work like that anymore. <laughs> now the laughter is getting truly awkward, you know, late in the day. It doesn't work like that. The publishing model's changed, and this is really, really exciting. We don't just publish stuff in these old, expensive tomes that you can only just like, pull out one at a time anymore. The library is different. The university is different. It's much more dynamic. Like Going to the library is not what it was before. It's really, really different. I wish people knew that. I get my students excited about this. It's much, much more open. And it means a few different things for your life that I get really excited about. One of them is that you can read the same information now as, say, the doctors or the scientists that you interact with do. I asked my pharmacist about this. I said, where do you get the information about like drug interaction that you give to me? Because they give you a little handout. It's always like in a filing cabinet. It's like, oh, I got the handout. It's like, where did the filing cabinet come from? And she said, I get it from this database. I said, okay, well, where does the da database come from? And you follow it back, and it's stuff I could have looked up at our library. That's pretty cool. You don't need to ask somebody to ask somebody to ask somebody anymore. You can find it. And if you're interested, you can find it first. My doctor actually prescribed something for me a while back. You can tell I'm on some medication. <laughs> and I looked it up, and I said, you know, what are the side effects of this? And she said, I think it's this, and it's a little bit of this. And then I looked it up. There was a study last month that came out. Last month. Of course, she's not going to read that yet. She's got lots and lots of patients, but I can. And if I have the disposition to ask the question, and I know a little bit about reading medical studies, just a bit, then I can. And that kind of changes the whole game. If you take a look at the open access databases, there are now millions of articles you can get for free. When I started, actually, as an academic, you know, a few years ago, not too many, if I published a paper and wanted a copy of it, they would charge me $35, me. And they would charge my students $35. 
I, I write it for free. I never get paid for any articles I write. The university pays my salary, comes out of tax dollars, and it's given to students in a public institution, and they want to charge us money to read it. But that's changed just in the last few years. And they can get this stuff for free, really broadly. And that's just thrilling. I mean, you could go down the street to the public library and look this stuff up, and for the first time in human history, have the same access as the most privileged person you can find. That's pretty amazing. Now, beyond even this, we see that journalism's changed. And for two particular reasons. One of them is crowdsourcing, which is really exciting. The other is narrow casting. These are trendy words. As an academic, you have to have trendy words, right? It doesn't work otherwise. The internet is so broad that you can get these tiny little questions that somebody out there really, really cares about. And now that applies to lots of things. I'm sure you can get lots of really good Star Trek commentary. I'm playing dumb. You can. <laughs> I have a pair of socks with Spock ears on them. I'm like, should I wear those? And they sort of pull the pant leg up at some point. Like, no, that's, that's too much. <laughs> you can get that information translated in a much more effective and interesting way. This website just came out last year. It's called Vox, as in voice. Instead of giving you the news, it gives you the background to the news. So if something big comes up in, the, in say, a train crash, is in this case, or you know, the vaccine controversies or whatever, instead of saying, this happened, you know, Jenny McCarthy has said this crazy thing about vaccines, they'll say, this is what you need to know to make decisions about it. And here's 10 quick explanations of the key ideas and the key studies in that area. That's really exciting. Brand new, it was like venture fund, it was a venture capital funded, you know, some of these upstart things. It's really cool. I use that for a lot of my classes now. The other thing is Wikipedia. People use this all the time because it comes up in Google first, but it does a couple of things that for this new sort of open era of scientific decision making are exciting. One of them is their sources. Wikipedia is very thoroughly sourced now. You can click on it and find out where the ideas came from. But even more exciting is this. Nobody ever clicks this one. This is the version history. So if you go to a Wikipedia page, you can check who's changed it, how it was edited, and when. And there's actually arguments going on behind the scenes about why. Nature, one of these big scientific journals, did a study to see if Wikipedia is accurate in the natural sciences. And it turns out it's often more accurate than our best journals, because it's much more thoroughly edited and much more contemporary. The research has also changed. And this has totally changed everything, even from just a couple of years ago. It used to be that the average citizen only consumed science. That you and me, we would look it up if we could when we went out and had to make some kind of decision, like about medication. But now you can create science. And this is very, very recent, like last five or eight years. You can actually be involved in real scientific discovery. And there's a few examples here. I can, if you email me, my cards are out on those tables there. I can send you the links for these, but we'll just sort of run through them quickly. I have a PlayStation at home. After my daughter goes to bed, this is who I spend time with. When <laughs> one person went like, woo, thank you. Uh, when I'm not using it, I can switch it over to connect with Stanford and engage in the protein folding at home study, where excess computer power is linked into a university where it runs simulations on proteins. So when I'm sleeping, my PlayStation could be doing science. That's pretty cool, but you know, you really aren't really involved. You just hear the fan going, I guess, when you go to bed, right? That's cool, but it doesn't do a whole lot for me being a scientist. This one's really interesting. You can do the same thing. You can use your computer and hook up to the search for extraterrestrial life, where your computer can help to analyze radio signals to see if there are aliens out there. Now, you put that together with my Star Trek reference earlier, and you can see where this is going. <laughs> okay, I'll bring this mic home. I'm like, hello? No. <laughs> <sighs> this is a really practical one. You can download an app to your phone, and when you see garbage floating around English Bay, you can report it into a database to help track marine debris, which is really interesting. If you're planning interventions to clean up the water in your community, this is a really exciting way to start doing that. The best one I found, though, is this one here. There is a study, and this is one you're really involved, where they will send you ancient maps and ship logs that say this is what the weather was like today on the ship on the way to wherever, that computers can't analyze. They can't analyze them because they're handwritten, shorthand on like old sheets of paper. The computer can't discern that yet, it doesn't work. So you can sign up and they will send you these things and you record it and enter it into the database and join the discussion about this ancient climate data. 
that's really interesting. If you go look up this website, there's a video of the scientists running it, and they, they shoot him in the archives, in the basement of what I'm sure is a huge building, talking about how much they need this help. You know, like, it's, it's really, really interesting. I feel bad for him. It seems dark down there. So you can get involved. And so it doesn't need to look like this anymore. It doesn't need to look like information out there that's not part of your life and that you're not a part of. You can understand more of it. You can get more of it. You can analyze more of it. And you can create more of it than has ever been possible. So in a certain sense, this is the best time there's ever been to know more about science. One of the best times there's ever been to analyze and use and develop the skills of science. And one of the best times that there's ever been to be a scientific kind of person. And so in the end, I think this is the most romantic and thrilling and exciting time that there's ever been to not be a scientist. Thanks for your time. Uh, thanks to uh, David for a really interesting and, and kind of empowering presentation. So thank you for that. Um, I'm sure you have some questions. So we have some people with the microphones. And if you put up your hand um, and ask a brief question, David will be interested in answering it. So any questions? I just thought uh, I might, we might ask you, since you do teach a lot of first year students in an educational transitions type course that's trying to you know, make them aware of their opportunities in university and also maybe to um, take away some of their fears, empower them to feel like they will have the tools to, to make it through university. Um, how are those students reacting to science? We, we have science requirements in, in, for instance, our arts degrees. Often, like from my perspective, um, students delay taking those requirements until they absolutely have to. Um, and what do you think are the, the best methods for you know, uh, removing the fear of science uh, and, and the sense that there are people who are already scientifically not as literate as they ought to be. What are some of the tools that we can use to encourage students not to be afraid of science? Well, the first thing is that it's our fault that they're not excited about it in the first place. Our fault being adults and teachers and people who work in education systems. Uh, if you take a look at the data, kids start off basically scientific. Just fundamentally, humans are scientific. We're curious, we like to investigate, we like to test, we like to observe. My daughter is constantly doing this. She knows how the dog reacts to every form of bludgeoning that you can find in the house. She just observes it. But as you go through primary school, especially for girls, they slowly learn that science is boring and rigid and male. And so by the time they get into grade six or seven, they like science much, much less than they did before because they've learned that it's the stale and an interesting thing, right? And it takes a long time to work them back to seeing what science actually is, this amazing and romantic thing that we get to do in this universal language to find out things that matter to all of us. Tremendously exciting, so that's one piece of it. Once they get to university, though, it's almost always the same problem. That they'll, you'll have this experience to be a little bit startled about science, but then you show them a couple of ways in which those things can impact their lives, and they're like, wait a minute. So I had an experience like that. I didn't like science at all coming out of high school. And then when I got into teaching, I started learning, oh, actually, if I understand the different stages of cognitive development, actually, I can construct better activities for kids. Or I started to read studies, you know, one of the basic educational psychological studies is about this guy who just got some kids in a room to play marbles and saw what happened. And just wrote a lot down about it. Fascinating. They invented their own rule system and that one little study becomes the building block for study after study after study. And I can guarantee you if you show me an elementary classroom, I could show you manifestations of those beliefs from, you know, 80 years ago. That's pretty amazing. And so once they get in the room there, in those first year classes, you just need to show them how amazing some of this stuff is. And they've got lots, you know, teachers have this little book, basically, in your phone of all these amazing examples of things. And there's just so many of them that we can collect that are going on at the university that you can use. I've got some in education. I do some all over the place. When I used to teach science in high school, I had these amazing things. Like my brother made this. My brother's a science teacher. It's this pipe with holes every inch. You put a propane source on one side and a rubber bladder on the other. Don't do this at home. Or at school. Indeed, don't do this. And if you put a speaker up to the, the rubber bladder and then light the gas source on fire, you get these little streams of fire coming out, whatever music comes out of the speaker is going to be equalized in waveform in the fire. So you can actually see the music like you would on the stereo in your car. That's pretty amazing. That tells you something really cool about you know sound and motion and so forth. Yeah. He's not allowed to do that at his school anymore for 
a number of insurance reasons. But <laughs> that seems to me self-evidently exciting and worthwhile and interesting, right? So how could you not find that amazing? Just curious if there's anything in particular happening in the world that sort of inspires you in terms of, yeah, like we can sort of convince the world to pay attention to science and science is friendly and fun. Well, if you take a look at some of those websites I have here, see how many people use them. How many people comment on Wikipedia edits, not on the articles, but on the edits. How many people sign up to do free labor uh, typing out and transcribing these old climatological maps, see that, and then ask if people care about science. Because they're doing it for nothing, just because science is intrinsically valuable and interesting. Right? It's like teaching. Right? You, you get up in the morning, you're excited to go do that thing. Right? And I take a look at some of these. There's millions and millions of hours being put into these by people who don't get paid. <laughs> I mean, on the evidence, it seems like science is doing very, very well indeed. Give people an opportunity to change something with it, and it all shifts. Mm. Thank you. There's one over there. Taz, Taz. Taz. Hi. Um, Hi. I was wondering if you have any thoughts about um, addressing scientific illiteracy in media. Yes, there's a really good scholar named Grace Reed I worked with a few years ago who studies this, like the way we show it in, say, a newspaper. And one of the problems is that we have this journalistic myth. And if you talk to scholars of journalism, they don't think this anymore, but lots of people in the public think they do. That if you have two sides to an argument, they should be given equal space and equal weight, which has gotten us in part to where we are with the climate change debate that the scientific evidence and scientists overwhelmingly support anthropogenic climate change, that is to say, climate change caused by stuff that we as humans have done. And a very, very small percentage, based on very, very weak evidence, deny this. But because of this convention, we tend to say, okay, left column of the page, climate change. Right column, normal cycle. Right? So one of the ways we can address this kind of illiteracy is to start reporting honestly the actual balance of evidence and stop tiptoeing around some of these questions in the interest of showing things being equal that aren't actually equal. There's a really good comedy sketch on this where uh, John Oliver, who's, a, who's an American comedian, actually got you know, like 97 scientists in the room and put them beside the three scientists that deny and say, okay, here's equal measure for climate change arguments, right? And that seemed much fair. And when you portray it like that in light of the actual evidence, it, it starts to be a lot easier to discern. But again, if you ask people about this, this happened with 9-11 conspiracy theories. Lot, I was teaching social studies at the time, and so all my students would come up and say, like, did you hear about that video on the internet? And as a teacher, you're just like, <laughs> no. <laughs> and they would say, look, this, the, the towers dropped like this, and this is why, and here's the, and you could tell they haven't looked into it. They just watched a really slick video. But when you give them access to the full range of information portrayed accurately, it wasn't very hard to start undermining that. Um, I was actually just wondering, uh, kind of what he was asking is, what platforms or media do you see as being the most effective in transmitting, or transmitting scientific information to people that aren't scientists, mm. uh, like social media or conventional media or things like Science World? Like what, what do you see as actually being the most effective and most accurate way? Well, if you saw that chart earlier, it said knowledge, skills, and traits or attitudes. All of those things require different experiences, right? So to change a trait takes more time and more experience. So if I want my daughter to be really scientifically minded, among other things, I should make sure that she comes to places like this. I should make sure that when we go outside, we stop and say, oh, look at that bug. That wasn't there yesterday. That kind of stuff. But if we're talking about just getting new information, that's a wholly different medium, right? So there's one called Rap Genius, this website. It's not about rap anymore. It's an annotation engine so that people can take texts, any kind of text, and they could explain it in the next column. And so this worked really well for rap lyrics. Apparently people have trouble interpreting rap lyrics. Right? <laughs> okay, I could make a couple stories there. People have trouble with this. So they created this website and said, okay, let's explain these things. This is what the author was talking about. Let's invite the author, and the author comes in and says, no, that's actually not what I meant. And they actually got some really famous rap artists on this. It's fascinating stuff, right? And they said, okay, what, why not use this for anything? 
So if you go on there now on Rap Genius, they have like Euripides and stuff like that. <laughs> and then people talking about this in the margins. And how powerful is that? If you get the study up there and the scientist says, okay, this is what I'm saying here, here it goes. And then a couple of people saying, okay, well that's what that word means and it's used differently here. And we have a conversation around it out of nowhere. And that's the thing, when we all have access to the same information, we can create our own tools. And they can be different tomorrow than they were today. Almost all of the websites I mentioned here have been created in the last couple of years. And they could be totally different by the time you get home. But the key is if we all have access to the stream of information and we're encouraged to use it and make decisions, then anything's possible. So are you sort of advocating for a more interactive, open, acti open access platform that doesn't really currently exist to a large extent? Is that what you're kind of talking about? I'm or advocating for tiers of interaction in media. So in that case, there's a primary source with the research data, you know, the old tome model, but then there's someone translating as an intermediary, right? So part of it's definitely radically open access, but part of it's also helping us to digest the stuff that's out there. Because millions of articles take millions of hours to understand, and we need people helping us through this. So crowdsourced, much broader, much more open, but at the same time, trying to digest and analyze that specialist data that not everybody has access to and not everybody understands. Hmm. Sir. Uh, <clears throat> do you see... Uh, really enjoyed your talk about the pipeline mm -hmm. and complex questions. Mm -hmm. Really complex one at the mm -hmm. moment uh, is the political side, the election coming up and trying mm -hmm. to make a rational decision there. Do you see any opportunity for science? And as you talk mm -hmm. about open access mm -hmm. platforms where we could come together and crowdsource and somehow mm -hmm. shared uh, beliefs that uh, really need to be worked on can float to the surface. The well thought out reasoned mm -hmm. positions can come together. A really complex bringing together, not just a grab bag of who's offering the yeah. best goodies today. What is the, a full on costed platform and what is going to move forward in these rapidly moving times, I just find it so frustrating that we're on the brink of, I like to refer to it as political infinity, with the right politics, mm. the sky is the limit, and the likelihood is we're going to continue churning. How the heck can we mm. get the scientific and political information crowdsourced together into one place to live our <laughs> Mm -hmm. possibilities. Well, th that's one of the things that's really interesting about this is that's the point of a really democratic system, by which I don't mean a vote for a person, but rather a system in which people share in deciding and governing. That if you just get out of the way, people naturally create their own systems of mobilization. So there's a myth right now that, that young people, like teenagers, aren't that politically engaged because they tend not to vote as frequently as older people do. But if you dig a bit deeper into their social media use, for example, they are much, much more politically active than any generation that we can find evidence for. Because what they do is they say, oh, that thing matters to me. Let's create an ad hoc group of people using our social media that care about that thing and send a message of that group of people to the people who can change it. That's pretty extraordinary. That's the kind of thing we haven't seen since like Vietnam War protests 50 years ago. Young people organically creating grassroots kind of activism that can happen just like that. Now, sometimes it works really well, and sometimes it's scary, right? When that dentist shot the lion there a few weeks ago in Africa, people immediately mobilized, immediately. There was a global outrage at that act. People were at his dental practice protesting before he got home, as far as I can tell. That's pretty amazing. It's scary, there seems like there's some bullying there, but we can certainly mobilize more than we ever could before. Now, for the election, that's a great example. The data on economic growth seem uniformly to suggest that in periods of economic recession, that government spending actually works pretty well to stimulate economies, right? But we get a different suggestion quite often in the media, where people will suggest, for instance, that governments can't spend more than they take in. Just like households, you have to pay your debts. Now, it might be true that we should run smaller deficits or save more money or keep more surpluses, but that claim is scientifically untrue. Households don't print money. They don't. Governments do. And so the significance of money to an economy is different from a governmental perspective, government that controls the bank, versus like a household. This is why Greece, for example, is in such a difficult position, because they don't control their own money. 
And so when people say that, oh, we'll end up like Greece if we spend any more money, well, that's just not true. I mean, you can make lots of different distinctions and decisions about that and vote for who you want to. But the economics seems reasonably clear in this case, actually. And so the more we can talk about those things in the open, the more we can make these decisions based on the evidence. When I was uh, 18, I got a $500 check from the government of Alberta for nothing. Literally nothing. Everybody who was over 18 got it. We didn't know why, but we sure all voted differently after. <laughs> it was my first Xbox. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Klein. Uh, any other questions, Desiree? Well, if I could thank everybody quickly. Uh, it's a lovely evening, and uh, I know the jokes can be a bit much. I'm very grateful for everybody for coming out and for asking questions and being patient and so forth. And thank you for supporting KPU and Science World. Yes, Bye. and...